So um, I'm George Percival. I'm one of the two co-chairs of the geospatial track, along with Jim Hughes. Uh, and here um, we'll begin to transition to the semantics topic with Apache Jenna. And for that, we have Marco Newman, uh, who will provide us a presentation. Marco, over to you. Thank you, George. I will now share my slides. I hope you can see them. So, um, welcome to ApacheCon 2021, uh, the geospatial track. As George said, my name is Marco Newman. I am an information scientist and a Jenna user for more than 20 years now. And I'm your presenter for this Apache Jenna GeoSparkle talk today. Last year, I had the opportunity to present to the ApacheCon 2020 Jenna track to give an update on the progress of the Apache Jenna GeoSparkle implementation. But my goal at the time was to bring the Jenna community up to speed with recent contributions to the code base. And if you are still new to the geospatial semantic web, you can review the recording of the previous presentation online in your own time on the web. While today's talk is similar, I have made some changes since I think that most of you in the audience today are experienced spatial experts or keenly interested in geospatial data processing in general but had relatively little contact to the world of RDF standards and tools so far. So I will focus on introducing you to the specific concepts and motivations that led to the Apache GeoSparkle module, rather than talking too much about foundational aspects of generic spatial data processing. Jenna is a semantic web framework for the Java platform to represent, process, and store RDF data in accordance with semantic web standards produced by the W3C, the World Wide Web Consortium. GeoSparkle is an extension to the semantic web standards and is sometimes used synonymously with, semantic, with the semantic geospatial web in general. But I would describe that as a much more involved effort as a vision to introduce meaningful spatial information to the global web to enable automatic data exchange. Today, I will speak about GeoSparkle or specifically the Apache Jenna GeoSparkle module in a much narrower context where the Apache Jenna GeoSparkle module is primarily just an extension to the Apache Jenna project to represent and process spatial data in a runtime system in accordance with a particular geospatial standard. It's an advanced topic in the Jenna ecosystem. If you are completely new to RDF, the Semantic Web, or the Apache Jenna project, please review the introductory material on the Jenna site or any other abundantly available documentation and books or on the web before taking this presentation. The Jenna project is actually more than 20 years old and attempts to process and manage spatial data with RDF are almost as old. My own first geospatial query processing pipeline for Jenna was implemented in 2003 based on the RDQL query engine and an Oracle spatial blade with dedicated spatial access methods in accordance with the OpenGIS simple feature specifications for SQL in combination with a spatial filter in the application layer for further spatial data processing. My research at the time took a narration paper by Max Egenhofer toward the semantic geospatial web, which was published in 2002. The paper was obviously much in line with his foray into the world of the systematic exploration of spatial relationships that has already gained traction a decade earlier with his joint paper with Robert Franzosa in 1991. While Max and his team had a more conceptual vision at the time, 
The focus was on the application and demonstration of spatial querying with RDF data specifically. The RDF spatial process I had implemented at the time had a spatial first design and was coded with Java and as already mentioned, was covered with a relational spatial blade with simple feature support in SQL, where a web client would query a spatial index to retrieve a candidate set as URIs for if required, would load more geometries for further evaluation from the database. Ultimately, the query results would be passed to the Jenna RDQL query processor for query RDF query pattern matching. In 2007, we have introduced um, spatial predicates to the Sparkle query language directly. And in 2008, we have created the geosparkle.org web service, which would not, which should not be confused with the OGC GeoSparkle standard. To demonstrate these spatial property functions in the Sparkle query language on the web. The geosparkle.org web service has used JTS at the time for the mapping of spatial predicates to the runtime evaluation of RDF predicates as seen in the screenshot. The work was the result of a collaboration between myself and Taylor Cowan at the time at Travelocity, who was interested in proof search features for his consumer facing products. The implementation Google Big Table Chrome Store to persist spatial data rather than a TDB or MySQL database in, or in memory store, but we later moved that to a spatial store back with a TDB instance. Though the JTS project itself was released under the new lesser general public license, this would later become an issue for the Jenna project during its transition to become an Apache project. In the following years, we have seen a number of attempts to create new spatial features in Jenna, namely the Geospatial Semantic Web Index or the Geospatial Module based on the Lucene Spatial Indexer and a few ad hoc extensions to introduce property and filter functions for spatial data processing in Sparkle. In uh, 2009, October, the Open Geospatial uh, Consortium started to work on a standardization of the spatial query language for RDF, which was dubbed UGC, uh, UGC Geospatial. After approximately three years, the OGC was able to release version 1.0 as an official implementation standard in July 2012. Coincidentally, that's only a few weeks after the Apache project became an Apache top-level project itself. The OGC GeoSparkle standard defines a, a set of Sparkle extensions and rules and RDF OWL vocabulary based on the general feature model simple features, feature geometry, and the SQL multimedia extension. After that, very little happened in the Jenna spatial development for some time. But in 2018, the JTS project decided to go for an Eclipse public BSD license, which was much more suitable for Apache projects to make use of. This to some extent, led to the reactivation of the work on the GeoSparkle module, as these important tools for the heavy lifting became available again to us as a project. This renewed effort to improve the geospatial support in Jenna in accordance with the OGC GeoSparkle standard was mainly spearheaded by Andy Seaborn and Greg Alvinson. And I would add that for a functional and potent GeoSparkle module in Jenna, the availability of JTS was as, uh, uh, with a suitable license was a precondition for our project. As of September 2021, the old subsystem on the GeoSparkle.org web service has been retired and replaced with a new GeoSparkle module. The old GeoSparkle Geospatial model and initial spa uh, spatial query support systems 
that were introduced in 2007 are now removed from the Apache project code base with the Apache Jenna 4.20 release. So let's have a look at the Apache Jenna GeoSparta module. As already mentioned, it attempts um, or it is an attempt to implement all six conformance classes of the OGC GeoSparkle implementation standard from 2012. The OGC GeoSparkle standard establishes these six conformance classes. Any GeoSparkle implementation should strive to comply with to be standards conformant. These conformance classes are core, topology vocabulary extension, geometry extension, geometry topology extension, an RDFS entailment extension, and a query rewriting extension. Now, the core model introduces the requirement for two classes for the representation of geospatial data, the geospatial object and the geo feature. The geospatial object is used to represent any feature or feature with a geometry. Geo feature represents the top level feature and is introduced as a subclass of geo, the geospatial object and defined as disjoint with geometry. The second component, uh, the topology vocabulary, defines topological relationships that can exist between features. The, top, the topology vocabulary extension relation family is used for establishing topological relations between spatial objects. They may be used to connect features and geometries as well. In addition, a dimensionally extended nine distance matrix pattern should be available to specify an intersection pattern to represent a particular relationship. The different families of topological relationships that should be made available are defined in the standard as simple features, Egenhofer, and the region connection calculus, RCC8. The simple feature defines equals disjoint intersect touches within contains overlaps and crosses. Furthermore, the representation of each topolo topological relationship has to be definable in the form of a intersection matrix, as outlined here in the table. Um, the uh, Egenhofer uh, family defines uh, quite similar, equals disjoint meet overlap cars covered by inside and contains. As you've already noticed, the family are very similar and can be partially expressed with the same intersection matrix. So the last family uh, is the region calculus. Um, it consists of eight basic relations that are possible between two regions from left to right, top down, disconnect, externally connected, equal partially overlapping tangential proper part, tangential proper part inverse, non-tangential proper part, and non-tangential proper inverse. Here, uh, again, uh, the RCC8 is shown in form of a table with this associated intersection matrix pattern. Now, in the next component, the GeoSparkle standard defines the geometry extension. The geometry extension defines the geometry vocabulary and non-topological query functions, such as distance, buffer, convex hull, etc. It also establishes the requirement for, spatial, for a spatial reference system. This can now be conveniently established in the Apache GeoSparkle project with the following notation. Consider a URI to a particular coordinate reference system. Here, the World Geodetic System, short, WGS84, published by the European Petroleum Survey Group, short as EPSG, is all that is required to specify this particular spatial reference system for your geometry. Furthermore, the GeoSparkle standard requires two types of serializations to be available in the subsystem in the form of well-known text, or WKT, um, and the geography markup language, GML. 
The Apache GeoSparker model supports both formats out of the box and additional formats can be registered by extending the geometry data type. The geometry topology component defines topological query functions um, for the evaluation of geometry objects as can be seen in the table with the respective vocabulary. Next component defines the requirement for an RDF tailment extension, um, which is a mechanism to match implicit RDF triples that are derived based on RDF and RDFS semantics, both supported by Jenna out of the box for many years. Consider the following example. Uh, the set uh, with two features and associated geometries. If we describe the first object in the query without a reasoning subsystem, it will just report its type as landmark, where in contrast with an active RDFS entailment regime in place, Jenna will automatically assert that my location one is a geo spatial object and a geo feature as well, as defined by the GeoSparkle ontology. The last component is a query rewriting extension that allows the definition of query transformation rules for computing spatial relations between spatial objects based on their associated geometries. Consider the following example. For every feature that contains another feature assert a new triple, new data that materializes the relationship as a new uh, triple in the data set. Here, subject contains object, which will now be available for querying. In addition, Jenna introduces a range of custom functions to work with your spatial data that are not yet part of any standard. Um, for example, a function I like uh, particularly is the uh, transform spatial reference system. Um, to show you what this does for you is I've used to work on a project where the content was originally annotated with an Irish grid um, spatial reference system, the TM75. And, and it took me quite some time to rewrite the data uh, for processing in WGS84. But now with the new GeoSparker module, um, I can simply uh, connect Jenna to Apache SIS and we can batch process and transform geometries on the fly and use data directly as recorded in the original data source. Now, that's it. Um, uh, that's what I have with regards to the OGC GeoSparkle standard. And we can take a look at the entire OGC GeoSparkle ontology representation in, in its full glory. You can see here all the classes and the relationship properties in the ontology. Now, let's put this Apache Jedi GeoSparkle module into action. Um, uh, you can uh, build your new spatially enabled app with your standard Maven build. All you have to do is add your dependency for the Jenna GeoSparkle module, as is being uh, uh, which can be seen here in uh, the slide. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, now, um, you can build your Jenna application with a spatial query. Just set up your GeoSparkle config with an N memory store, create your Jenna model, load some data, wrap the model into the spatial index and you're good to go to create your first GeoSparker query with the query factory and query your data sets with the standard query extension factory. The query searches here for um, airports near latitude 51, 52, a longitude minus 0 0.2, which was a maximum distance of 50 kilometers. The location represents actually Russell Square in London, which is 
at the British Museum. And the results can now we can execute this query and we should see the result set here uh, in the uh, in the bottom half here of the screen. And it has two data sets. We can also um, print these data sets um, uh, on the on the map. And it shows Gatwick Airport in Stansted. It doesn't show Heathrow Airport, uh, which is not a problem because we can simply create new data and push that into the data store. And uh, we can now repeat the query and we'll get the um, uh, missing airport uh, plotted onto the map. Okay, now let's take a look at uh, geometry feature spatial relations. Um, we um, can, let's say, vectorize um, and extract data for an airport. Here um, I'm using, um, you know, uh, as you can see, this is Denver International Airport. I'm using a tool called GIS, you're probably all familiar with. Uh, to create two spatial objects, one that represents the airport and another one that represents an airplane, a rather large airplane and that, uh, but it's just to uh, serve as, a, as an example here. So we insert the geometries um, now into our query. Here the first polygon represents the airport, the second uh, uh, the geometry for flight Southwest Airlines 1560. We can now filter for a simple feature contains relationship, which should report false as the geometries do not contain each other. So that's correct, it's false. Um, now uh, we can alter the position of the airplane in space and move it into the shape. So we can um, create uh, a, a another, uh, we can now search uh, for a, an intersects relationship here in the form of an intersection matrix pattern, uh, which is, can be seen also on the at, at the end of this um, query here. So we're looking for an intersects relationship, which should be true. Let's see, yeah, that's correct. So Jenna reports that they have an intersection. And now let's uh, finally uh, move the plane entirely into the airport and repeat the first query relationship and which would duly report that um, the uh, airplane is now uh, contained within the airport geometry. Okay, so there are two types of releases that come with Foseki. One is a plain GeoSparkle uh, module, which can be used in your application development in Java, um, and a standalone Foseki enabled server. So you can just uh, hit this jar file and fire up your Jetty server, which is now fully complete uh, GeoSparkle enabled from the command line. And you can push in some data in the restful way. Um, here we're using this put, which is a little tool that comes with the Fusiki release, with the, with the Jenna release. And we're pushing in the GeoNames database into the Fusiki server. Um, the for uh, the geonames data that should now be available. I'm using here a, a commercial grade tool called uh, Top Rate Composer and um, Enterprise Data Governance System, which actually has a full integration of the uh, Apache Generator Sparkle uh, module. Uh, so that will make it easier for you to query your data. Um, and as you can see here in our in the screen, this is an example um, um, where we um, can search for all features of type hotels in Germany, and then it will report in the bottom half all available data sets, and we can also uh, um, print that uh, into a screen window, um, but I would like to limit the result sets uh, to all hotels that are close to the River Rhine, which is the second largest river in Europe. And again, I will um, use QGIS to um, vectorize the river information. 
Preferably, I would like to go and get this from an LOD server somewhere. But here I'm using this tool QGIS to vectorize the river. Once I have the river uh, vectorized, I can export the river as a well-known text format geometry. Uh, my update is again another query. As you can see in the screen here, we insert data as well-known text format and automatically update our Fuseki database. So once we um, have that in our data set, we can perform another query. And this time, actually, we would like to limit the range of available hotels that are in or about one kilometer to the River Rhine. And now it reports only 435 items uh, that uh, satisfy my query. And these can also now be printed onto the map module, as you can see in the screen. All right. So now you may wonder how does the Apache Jenna GeoSparkle module compares to other GeoSparkle engines in the marketplace with regards to its standards compliance. While the original OGC GeoSparkle standard has defined a number of compliance requirements queries, only a limited number of tests were performed, yet mostly as part of activities from within um, the linked uh, data community. This year, we have seen the release of the GeoSparkle compliance benchmark. And as the name suggests, it focuses on the compliance of triple stores and their respective GeoSparkle support rather than on the evaluation of performance considerations. The GeoSparkle compliance benchmark extends the requirements outlined in the OGC GeoSparkle standard and tests 206 queries um, to uh, uh, that that are compliant with the standard, uh, uh, and um, it um, is. I'm happy to report that uh, Apache GeoSparkle module comes out on the top. Out of all tested uh, stores, currently sevens are in the database, and the GeoSparkle for Siki uh, version 1.17 answers 177 correct answers out of 206 and weighted by each GeoSparkle component compliance, it arrives at an overall compliance of 82.75%. This is good news and very encouraging for future work on the module. Um, there are currently uh, GeoSparkle queries that do not pass. And I'm very keen to discuss this actually with the people from uh, the JTS uh, project. One um, area that we currently fail in is comparison of empty geometries. It seems to be the case that JTS likes to differ uh, on the GeoSparkle uh, um, standard with regards to uh, this result. Um, also, a simple feature states that the boundary of a point is empty, which is the boundary intersection of two points would also be empty, and that gives a negative comparison results. Also something that the GeoSparkle standard uh, begs to differ with. And there are also some issues currently um, with some functions, uh, primarily the distance functions um, and some uh, non-topological query functions in the geometry extension. But not uh, uh, to further improve um, the system in, in the future. So there are a few new features in the pipeline, um, such as raster data support and the standardized uh, um, reference, uh, conceptual reference space, which is a um, coordinated reference system, um, but that is still a work in progress. I think uh, the idea is 
build a new ontology for the SRS. Uh, there is currently also a discussion at the OGC mail list about that. Well, there are a few queries I'd like to see in the future, but I haven't got around to actually implement them. Um, so capabilities I'd like to see would be a feature extraction. That's something I would really um, enjoy having access to and the ability to transform according to position, rotation, and scale. And furthermore, uh, we really need some more work around 3D spatial access methods. They are currently not available in the GeoSparkle standard, and they are also not available in the Apache GeoSparkle module. Now, OK, with that, I would like to thank uh, the OGC for working uh, on the geospatial standards, the tool support we get from projects like JTS and SIS that enable the Jenna system to perform the way it does, and of course, the Apache Jenna community itself for its continued effort to further integrate geospatial features into the project to enhance the availability of emerging semantic web standards in code and in runtime. And thank you for your attention. And I hope uh, that this presentation was useful to some of you and helps you to better understand the effort and that um, you might actually consider to join the Apache Geosparker project um, to help us further improve the spatial data support on the semantic web in the future. Also, thank you to the organizers of the spatial track this year at ApacheCon 2021 for getting this event online. Again, thank you. Thank you, Marco. Excellent presentation. Amazing the work that uh, goes on by collaboration, right? Uh, sharing different work and the like. Um, let's see, looking to see if there's any questions in chat. I see Jim made a comment uh, about JTS, who he's a committer on JTS. <laughs> I don't know if you had, Jim, you wanted to expand any more on that? Oh, sure. Um, yeah, since, since I'm... Um... The, the committer that helped get JTS relicensed. Uh, I, 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 first, I, 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 I'm glad to hear that uh, the more Apache friendly license uh, helped you out. So thanks for uh, mentioning that, Marco. Um, uh, it, I actually yeah. realized that only recently how important that change was because I got quite some pushback back in 2012. Uh, and I wasn't quite sure because it was such a lovely API to work with and so difficult to replace uh, anything else. So coming back in 2018 was definitely um, important for the GeoSparker pro project. In a yeah. Um, yeah. And um, just since I've got the benefit of uh, being one of the organizers and I can you know, use the audio, um, I'll go ahead and say that if you've got questions about uh, the details of how uh, some of the relationships are working in JTS, because you mentioned uh, the empty geometries, for instance, and how those things work, um, the uh, JTS has a um, mailing list, but we also use uh, Gitter for a lot of conversations. So if you're happy with um, Gitter, I'll throw the link in chat. Uh, we can chat with uh, Martin Davis. Um, Martin's the sort of lead and key developer for JTS. He's been working on it for over 20 years at this point. Um, and he he's, you know, pretty good about responding quickly about some of the differences. Um, since JTS is focused on implementing the geospatial model that's defined by OGC simple features, I'm guessing that's where if we... Um, and it sounds like you're the right person to have this conversation with Martin. If you each pulled out your standards for what GeoSparkle is expecting uh, for relationships and what simple features are expecting, expecting for relationships, we'll probably see that those standards, they may disagree slightly. And um, it's either the standards disagree, and that's why we're running into trouble, or there's a JTS bug. If there's a JTS bug, we should absolutely fix it. Um, 
if the standards disagree, um, whenever you call out to JTS, you might just have to add that little bit of handling to say, okay, JTS is gonna do the wrong thing here. So let me check real quick to see if I'm in uh, a case where I need to override it. I, I, I would also say that these might be edge cases and they might not be relevant in the real world. And we're quite happy to live with them uh, the way JTS reports them. Um, it depends on our users. If they come back with some major issues that break their queries or mm -hmm. their expectations, of course, then we have to take another look at the math and uh, the way JTS um, interprets the relationships. But yeah, it only took 20 years <laughs> to get to this point. Uh, so it might take another 20 years to agree exactly on uh, all aspects of the relationships. Um, yeah, but definitely, uh, I think I'm very happy with the progress and also the way it now integrates into the Apache Jenna uh, project. I think we're definitely in a good place. And as you can see, the evaluation benchmark shows that we are actually in a good position. Yeah, no, that's that's really great to uh, hear, even with uh, the uh, corner cases you're pointing out that the standards pretty well uh, represented. Um, cool. So last year, uh, as part of some of these sessions, we had a discussion about JTS uh, and Apache Calcite. Uh, so Apache Calcite provides, um, you know, query capabilities for a lot of different things, uh, but they were implementing spatial queries and ran into a question in JTS about boundaries. And uh, one of Martin Davis's blog back from 2007 uh, on his need to define a covers operation uh, because of the way the boundary was treated on a polygon between simple features. And I'm wondering, is that the same issue coming up again with your requirement, Marco? That you possibly, earlier possibly. Uh, I mean, it, it, it makes sense if the points do not have a boundary that they are not treated as, a, as an object by the runtime system. So it makes sense to me. The, the question then would be very specifically, is it a point geometry intersection? Is it a geometry, like a polygon polygon relationship? And yeah, you are, I, I think I would agree that, um, you know, I need to see the use case uh, where it actually becomes apparent how it should work. You know, what kind of a relationship actually should be represented in the query. And maybe there is another way of representing the same query, but using a different set of geometries and relationships in the data set. But that is quite complex, at least from my point of view, um, until I see the actual data set and understand what the relationship should be between right. uh, the features. But yeah, I mean, um, uh, it's, uh, you know, the, the relationship between, you know, your real world objects and these mathematical objects do not always align, you know, uh, mentally. <laughs> and uh, so, um, you know, with the, the ge empty geometries, I have not found a use case where this could be taught, but maybe that changed, you know, with a, with a, with a customer who actually wants to do it specifically in a dynamic data set. Maybe they're also using temporal data where the data set changes over time. So they might have a different reference model uh, for the interpretation. 